The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levin presents with Dr. Jeffrey Seif. Hearty shalom to all of you. Jeffrey Seif here, pleased to welcome you to a very special edition of Zola Levitt Presents. Special edition because it's a year-end edition during which time we get to reflect some on where we've been in the year. And we've been all over the land of Israel, poking cameras into interesting places and getting interviews with very interesting people. Speaking of interesting places, behind me is the city in that song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Well, it's getting a little bigger, I might add. Uh, and we're in there reporting what's happening there and round about, for instance, Jerusalem, just a little neighboring city. We're all about getting you to see places and people. And speaking of people, one of the highlights this past year was our interview with Danny Elon, a minister, in fact, a former ambassador from Israel and now a deputy to the prime minister. What a guy. He's going to give you a window into understanding why Israel is forever lambasted in the press and in the world. Here in Israel, of course, we appreciate very much the leadership of the United States, the American people. Uh, which are, in my mind, the most decent, the most courageous uh, in, in the world. They are the ones who could stand and have actually did stand against uh, world injustice, whether it was Nazism or whether it was in communism, and now uh, terrorism. And we are proud to be uh, the United States' best friend and ally here in this region, and I believe beyond. I'm puzzled why um, it defies reason that people just want to be hell-bent on castigating Jews and Israel because there's such a strong, um, I mean, there's another side to the story. Why doesn't the world want to hear it or why don't people want to tell it? Do you have any sense of that? It, 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 it confuses me. Well, first of all, I would say uh, it's because these automatic majorities that the Arabs and Islamic countries and non-democratic countries have Look, there are 22 Arab countries which are voting as one bloc. These 22 Arab countries, the Arab League countries, are a part of a larger group called the OIC, Organization of Islamic States, which has 57. So already you have 57 votes against Israel or against the United States, or Europe for that matter. These 57 are yet part of a larger group used to be called the Group of 77, or the Non-Aligned. Now there are 118 countries in this group. So already you have an automatic majority. 118 countries out of total of 192 member states in the United Nations. You have already an automatic majority, and I can have you that if they decided today to pass a resolution that the Earth is flat, they will succeed. Now, why do they succeed? Because they have the votes. But also, there is no real, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a, a conscience, world conscience, a, a beacon that would be of decency and hope, aside from the United States, that would call their bluff and would castigate them. And this is because maybe uh, there are some splits among uh, Western democracies. Maybe it's because of convenience. Maybe because it's of laziness, maybe some because of very narrow interests, short-term interests. They do not want to upset the Arabs. They, they, they uh, are um, dependent on uh, oil supply, things like that. But, but in the long run, it is very, very, uh, very, very urgent and very, very important that countries, like-minded countries, decent people would pull together. Otherwise, you know, divided, we fall, united, we can not only survive, but thrive. 
Well, there you heard from a, a state leader, and now I want you to hear again from a church feeder. Lance Lambert uh, speaks to churches all over the world, and when it comes to Friends of Israel, uh, within the Christian world, few are more intransigent than him in his resolute support for what God is doing here amongst the people in the land. You know, ministries, ministers tend to want to promote themselves, but I want you to hear people better than me. So off we go in a second, and you're going to hear from Lance. David Dolan, former CBS correspondent, interviews him, and I want you to hear what he has to say, let it get into the head, and then down to the heart. Off we go now to Lance Lambert. I remember very well when I was... Uh, I couldn't have been more than 14 or 15. I remember uh, Alan Redpath getting very steamed up uh, one Sunday morning, gripping the sides of the pulpit and saying, as sure as I stand here, God will judge the British Empire and the British Isles for what they have done to the Jewish people. He said, at this very time, the Royal Air Force is bombing uh, survivors of the Holocaust, and the Royal Navy is shelling them and ramming their ships. He said, and then they're taken either into Cyprus or into Mauritius. And he said, um, the time will come when there will be no empire, and um, Britain will be an offshore island of, of Europe. And, um, and I remember some people getting up and walking out, and I thought they might be only a kid. I, I thought, oh, they, they've got luncheon appointments, the pastor's going on rather late. Um, and so they're off to their luncheon appointment. But actual fact, I learned later that they were patriots who were horrified that the pastor could say such a thing about the great British Empire upon which the sun never set. But the sun did set on it. And it set on it exactly the time that Israel became a state in 1948. That was the beginning of the dissolution of the British Empire. I have said again and again and again over the last few years that America is heading exactly for the same um, situation. Well, Lance, that's a very strong statement. Uh, it might be shaking some of the, the viewers in America right now. How close do you think we might be to such a unleashing very, of Very, very close. Very close indeed. I, I personally believe, and I, I, I say this very carefully, that the blame for this situation lies at the um, door of the church in America. How so? She has been more interested in wall-to-wall -wall carpeting ministers of education, ministers of youth, ministers of old age, ministers of everything, wonderful entertainment, marvelous choirs, great music on organs, pianos, and everything else, and has not understood that they have a responsibility for the nation in which they're found. The church on the whole, with glorious exceptions throughout uh, North America, both United States and Canada, has been asleep. It's true that uh, a number of uh, evangelical leaders went to Mr. Bush to warn him. But by and large, the church has been asleep because they believe that the United States would never fall, would never collapse. That's an impossibility. Just like people thought Britain could never collapse. It's an impossibility. It seems so, also yeah. at the time, yes. a major empire. Yes. I look at the American dollar. It's virtually losing its value. We really feel it over here in Israel. Absolutely we do. And I mean, and now there is real talk as to whether to change the dollar to another currency. I mean, that's unbelievable. The almighty dollar. And I might just add to this that Jerusalem is the bottom line in this whole conflict. The real conflict and battle is over Jerusalem 
And e- I can be even more specific. It is over one mi- square mile. It is the Temple Mount, where the house of the Lord once stood. That is the key to this conflict. There will be no peace because the Palestinians in the Islamic world insists on having Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And Israel finds it impossible to let go of Jerusalem. After all, the word Jerusalem doesn't occur once in the Quran. Lance Lambert uh, was a church leader, speaks to churches, as I'd said previously, and you heard him speak very directly. I like bold speech, by the way. I think in this world, it's in very high demand and very short supply. Many ministers are worried about how to protect their pulpits and protect their jobs. Lance Lambert seems to want to be a guardian of the truth, and so sometimes he says things that are rather direct, and I say kudos to him, someone I want to emulate. Well, in addition to hearing from uh, Christian leaders, we hear from Jewish leaders because we want you to hear people that you wouldn't otherwise hear, and Levi Chazan is just one such person. You know, I'm all about taking people to Israel, and we take them to the standard garden variety uh, Holy Land tour sites, but in conjunction with that, we like people to experience different aspects of Israel that are off the beaten path. Levi Chazan's place is not only off the path, but what he is all about is off the charts. Off the charts, that is, if you don't have a Bible in hand. And the reason why I say that is Levi Chazan is participating in the remanufacture. Now listen to this, this is super cool. He is participating in the development of a school, a field school, where uh, rabbis are training priests to officiate in the sanctuary. All this in anticipation of a rebuilt sanctuary. Friends, let me tell you, the implications of this are profound. Off we go now to Levi Chazan. Okay, we're located about 20 minutes out of Jerusalem in a place called, a settlement called Mitzpah Yeriko, which is uh, right outside of Jericho, overlooks Jericho. And uh, what we have established over here, and what will be in these premises, is a field school that is going to be the uh, preparations for the beginning of the third temple. In this field school, it's very unique. We will train priests and Kohanim, Levites, in order to uh, participate in their work in the temple service in Jerusalem. Now, I think this is a fascinating story. You live it and breathe it and participate in it day after day. Um, so it's just, I mean, I'm not saying it's pedestrian or mundane, it certainly isn't, but to think for a moment, there's a vision to regather the priesthood, to build a school, to train, to prepare for sacrifices, that's incredible. Now, you have to realize that the Jewish people have been out of touch for the last 2,000 years, not only separated from the land, but separated from their service. And a great aspect of, uh, of the Jewish people's service, which is listed in the Bible, is the service which took place in the temple in Jerusalem. It was a main, main part of the Jewish people's lives, their cycle, their holidays, whenever it was, everything centered around the temple in Jerusalem. The Jewish people have been out of touch of that. They've, they've been away from that. They, they, they've been removed from anything. Uh, remotely resembling any type of, of service in the temple. And, and what we're doing over here is to get them uh, renewed with this work, uh, to prepare them in order to teach them uh, all the aspects of the temple service itself, what they have to do, where they have to go. And uh, this we are, we are planning here to raise a generation of priests and Levites that will be able, when the time comes, to work in the temple service in Jerusalem. Mr. Kazan, what are the, what are the lines here all about and what's up with the stones? Well, this, this is actually where the, uh, the, the groundbreaking was done uh, a few days ago. And this is basically the, the base of the altar itself. The first stage of the field school is to build the altar. That's the most important aspect of the field school. And uh, what you see over here is the line markings is exactly where the site of the altar will be. And so what we've done over here is started construction on the altar and uh, that's, that's the pile you could see over here with the, with the hole. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's actually very historical because when King David first came to Jerusalem, the first thing that he did, uh, our rabbis of blessed memory teach us, is that he dug under the Temple Mount itself 
in order to, to establish the, uh, the outlet for the wine and water libations which were poured on the altar. You know, there was, on top of the altar there was tunnels which led underground and King David himself actually dug those tunnels out in order to prepare it. So the first stage that we've done is also made a, 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 a hole in the ground in order to prepare uh, our model over here for the wine and water libations. Mm, mm, mm. I am astounded. A couple of days ago, the news crews were here uh, advertising the story. There was some ground break breaking. I can still see the chalk lines here where the Mizbeach, where the altar is going to be. You see over here, uh, this is the hill that's, that's right uh, behind us with the one-to-one uh, -one scale of the temple and the altar inside of it. And when we're building over here the model, you have to realize this is not just uh, a, a small version of it. This is actually one-to-one -one scale of the same temple which was in, in Jerusalem uh, 2,000 years which stood there. We're talking about a, a, a building which is about 20 stories high. Just the altar itself is five meters. And uh, it's it's humongous task. It's a it's an unbelievable uh, task to undertake. And we plan to build it over here in this mountain. You can see over here the blueprints for the altar itself. This is obviously the main the main part of the work of the field school because this is where most of the work of the priests took place was on the altar itself. We also have the blueprints of the temple itself, of the field school. Uh, exactly the way that it was situated in Yerushalayim in its proper place. We read the Bible, we study, we study about King David and his time period, and King David himself uh, talked about how can I live in my well-established house where the temple of the, of the Lord is in a tent. And, and we say to ourselves, you know, how could it be that here we are, we're in our well-established houses today, 60 years after the fact that the Jews have returned to the land, and where is the house of God today? What is being done to the house of God? And, and we have no answer for that. So we're taking concrete steps in order to actually start the process of the third temple right here. When the first Jews came here, you know, to establish the land, it was also they rolled up their sleeves and they, and they rolled in the dirt and they had to make uh, roads and they had to construct houses. You know, every, everything that, that, that had to be done was done. And once we have this base, the next natural step is, is rebuilding of the temple for God. The story of the tabernacle is an enduring one, and as a Bible college professor for 21 years, uh, when I gave students the opportunity to write term papers, so many Christian students wanted to write about the Mishkan, this portable worship facility that's noted in the book Shemot and Exodus, where Moshe Rabbeinu, where Moses, is given instructions to manufacture this portable worship center. Not only that, Bible students are interested in the more permanent fixture uh, that was established uh, with Solomon's uh, participation, and then later on the Herodian uh, temple that existed in Jesus' day, which was felled, of course, in AD 70. There was a result, and we haven't, a revolt rather. There was a revolt, and uh, we haven't seen it since. Well, so much for history to speak to the moment, and Levi Chazan has. There are individuals that are bent on rebuilding re-engaging uh, the story of God at work in the world manifest through the Mishkan, through this portable worship facility. I wanted to take a moment to teach about it. And the reason why I want to do that is because it's uh, a story that has some 25 chapters allocated in the Bible. That's no small amount of text, by the way. Uh, the Bible wanting to give voice to God's home, and the representation of individuals bent on uh, working it up again to me is just so very fascinating. Well, to look at the first story in chapter 25 of Exodus, we're told, Vayomer Adonai El Moshe, the Lord speaks to Moses, saying, speak to Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, that they make an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And what's happening here is they're gathering um, uh, monies, in effect, to build together this wonderful testimony. And we're told in verse 8 that it's to make a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. It's interesting, behind me is Bethlehem and the doctrine of the incarnation. To use the Johannine Gospel, the Gospel of John, we're told that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that, that God, in effect, took on an earth suit. He took on some kind of form that humans can identify with, 
That's the argument in the person of Yeshua, Jesus. Well, that argument isn't entirely new because when we look in the Hebrew Bible, we discover that God wants to come and make himself known visually in some sense. And so he's very deliberate here. He says, let them make me a sanctuary. And why is that? Because I want to dwell among them. But he's very specific in verse 9, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furnishings, so you shall make it. Seems to me that the Lord wasn't minded to let them employ a lot of cre uh, creative, uh, you know, uh, imposition on the story. There's a specific way that God wanted it done. Well, the Hebrew Bible talks about the way that it's to be done, and the Mishnah expands on that some and lets individuals see how Jews construed it. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that Levi Chazan's story is so very fascinating because we're looking at people that have the Hebrew Bible on the one hand, the Jewish tradition on the other, and very methodically, very detailed according to the patterns shown, they're looking step by step by step to participate in the rebuilding of the temple. Now, for those that are interested in Jesus, this is a fascinating story because Jesus' second coming is connected. Jesus' reappearance on the stage of the human drama is played out against the backdrop of a world where there's a rebuilt temple. There's a variety of reasons uh, why I say that. I'm not going to explore it much here as I go out on this segment, but just so you know, you heard it from me that uh, the representation of temple worship is indeed significant. In fact, your participation with us is significant in my mind's eye as well. You know that uh, Levi Chazan and individuals at the Temple Institute and those that are engaged in all of this are, are relying upon funds from all over the Jewish world to help resurrect that story. Similarly, and I'll tell you this in a moment, that uh, we uh, need funds as well to help tell the story of God at work in the world uh, over in the States in our own unique Zola Levitt Ministries way. Well, we live in interesting times, don't we? And the fact that there are individuals here in Israel bent on rebuilding the temple and training up to service on the Mizbeach, on the altar, tells me we're living in very interesting times. I'm pleased to be here to help you understand those times, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. We had over 80 nations represented at this year's feast, more than 5,000 Christians. You mentioned uh, 700, 800 Brazilians. I think you also have to tip your hat to countries like Norway and uh, Finland and uh, from all over the world, from Africa, from Asia. We had flags from Hong Kong, from Thailand, lovely group, from all over the world. These are Christians who come up for the dynamic worship experience, the very profound Bible teaching that we have. But the, most of all, they want to go out in the Jerusalem march each year and express their love to Israel and, and the Jewish people out on the streets. That's our, that's our belief, that there will be one temple. That's what we yearn for. That's what we pray for every single day, that there will be a rebuilding of the temple. We feel that it's closer as the times become more difficult. But... And uh, what we have established over here, and what will be in these premises, is a field school that is going to be the uh, preparations for the beginning of the third temple. The time is coming very close that you know, God, God and Messiah has to come himself to help resolve these problems. Well, there you go. I've showed you some of what we've done in 2010. Now I want to show you a segment in a moment of what we're cooking up for 2011. We filmed it at the end of 2010, but it takes a while to go through the editorial process. It's a series that is really dear to my heart, and I'm sure it'll be dear to many of yours, and I want it to be dear to those of you that uh, are a little clueless And what's that. I want to talk to you about the land of Israel and God's plans for the people and the place. And I want to do this in part to counterbalance the insanity. It seems to me that in the contest for public opinion, truth is the first casualty of that war. And the way Jews are forever lambasted, the way Israel's drug through the mud, frankly, I find it horrific. And so with your help, your donations helped us to get here, and we went all about the land with an open Bible. Uh, we interviewed individuals, we had a media correspondents speak to us as well, and it's all about giving some biblical perspective on the world that we are living in. And even if you're not living here, you're seeing it. 
It's amazing how Israel is so small, but the attention it occupies in the world is so large. Off we go now to look at some segments for our series that will be airing in 2011 called Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. When we look in the biblical text, we know that God gave the land of Israel to the people of Israel. Uh, they had to go contend for it. We're at the southern end of the Golan Heights where we had intense battles in 1967. We're talking about Syria being just a few miles here. We're talking about Jordan being right, right behind us here as well. Joshua turned them back and he took Hatzor and he struck its king with the sword. And oh my word, friends, there was quite a battle that was fought here. It seems like it's prophesying being fulfilled with Israel emerging amidst all these tensions. The Syrians demanding that Israel evacuate this plateau. There is peace, as I said, between Jordan and Israel, but certainly not this other one. And uh, where it will end up, we don't know. But the fact that we're at a base and these guys are on the lookout all the time just uh, illustrates that that uh, battle still goes on. The people of Israel have had to contend for life ever since the beginning of their national life. It's a story that began yesterday, it's a story that's played out today, and it's a story that has prophetic import for tomorrow. Most ministries that do television bring the cameras into their world, typically a sanctuary and you have a dynamic Bible teacher that waxes eloquent with uh, a Bible in one hand and speaking forcefully behind a pulpit. I'm all good to go with that, I'm not beginning with the criticism. But I'm just trying to say, we don't bring you into our world with cameras, we bring you into the world. And not only the world at large, but the center of the world, and that is Israel. And let me tell you something, it's not cheap doing it. As you might well imagine, to bring film crews all across the world, and, and uh, the, the filming, the editing, it's very, very expensive. You know, people say Jews are all about going after the money, but if you've been following us at all, you know full well we never do it. You know, for me, fundraising is not fundraising, but the truth of the matter is, though it's not a lot of fun, someone's got to do it. And usually at the end of the year is the time when we do do it. And I need your help to tell this kind of story. Because this isn't a me thing, it's a we thing. And if this resonates in your heart, I'm simply an extension of passions that resonate within you. And if it's there in the heart, please, as an extension of what's in your heart, not cajoled by me, but as an extension of what's in you, when you see our address on the screen, will you please contact us? Will you send us a check and say, Jeff, I affirm what you're doing and I want to help you do it. So it's not just a you thing, but it's a we thing that together what we're trying to do is counterbalance the insanity in this world. Israel needs a lot of friends, and let me tell you, coming out of a tough economy, we need friends, we need some new friends, and let me count you as one of them. Well, thank you for watching this program. We're coming up next week. As you go now, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.